Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? You guys doing good? Well, if you want to jump up on your feet, we're getting ready to worship. Um, you guys enjoying your extra long weekend today? Um, if, you don't, if you didn't worship last week or if you don't normally worship, today's a good excuse to worship because you know tomorrow there's no work for most people. Um, that'll help. But we're going to read a verse real quick. They're going to pop it up on the screen for you. And this is one of my favorite verses. I said a lot of, about a lot of verses, but this truly is one of them. And here's what it says. It says, may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. Um, and it says, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. It says, then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And I love this verse because it says... Um, God's love is so big and it's so deep and so wide that we as humans, we can't even comprehend it fully. But Paul says, I pray that you could get a piece of it, right? I pray that you could understand just even a little bit of how big God's love is. And that's my prayer today, that as we worship and as we sing, that God will reveal His love to you. We've been talking about crazy love for a few weeks now. And um, today's our last day. And as we do that, I would just pray that, that God would, would reveal His love to us. That as we worship today, that each and every one of us would, would leave this place, change the difference, saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe how big God's love is and how deep and how wide it is. And so has, as we worship, set your mind on that, right? And it's now awesome God's love. Are you ready to go?
risen. And God, we come to celebrate who you are. Jesus, we come to lift up your name and to worship you. Lord, we love you. We come to worship. Come on, church, let's celebrate our Savior. Let's celebrate the one that took our sin and he overcame. Singing in a holy, happy day, happy day. You washed my sin away. The ushers could get ready. You can be seated as we're just staying in God's presence. We're going to take the table of the Lord. You know, it's interesting. How many know what weekend this is? It's Memorial Day, and I was thinking about that this morning. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know if you know the difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. I was unclear, and so I looked it up. Where? On Wikipedia, which is always the answer for everything. But I think you probably already know that on Memorial Day, we're celebrating those soldiers and those people that gave their life so that we could have freedom. In different wars, it started out in, uh, in honor of those who had died in the Civil War, both North and South. <clears throat> and then it began to represent soldiers that had died in every war since. Veterans Day, we celebrate those in, uh, in the armed services for what they do on a regular basis. But I was thinking about that, that we give a whole weekend, a whole holiday, a whole celebration, as we should for those that gave their life so that we could be free. But I thought about that, you know, communion is really our Memorial Day. Not Memorial Day for soldiers or for people even that we love and care for that maybe, you know, passed on, but for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gave his life for us so what? So we could have eternal freedom. Yeah. Not freedom for a day, not freedom in just one nation or one tribe, but literally freedom for everyone from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, past, present, and future. Freedom that doesn't last for a day or a week or a year, but freedom that lasts for eternity. And you know, when I think about that, and I wanna read a scripture, or have us read it together from Romans chapter five. I think Johnny got his, this is my favorite scripture from me, because I have a lot of favorite scriptures too, but this is clearly one of them that I always think about when I think about what Jesus did. <clears throat> and I believe, I think you guys were going to, was it verse uh, 1 you were going to start in? Let me go here real quick. I think it was verse 6, but we'll go ahead and read from here. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. <clears throat> we can rejoice too that when we run into problems and trials, for we know they help us develop endurance. 
and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, and this is that verse I love so much, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. That's powerful. While we were sinners, while we were utterly helpless, Christ died for us. And that's what we celebrate today. Can we stand together? We're going to celebrate this beautiful life of Jesus that he gave for us. Can you take the bread with me? Thank you, Jesus. Mm, in, mem in memory, God, in remembrance of your powerful life that you gave for us. Thank you. Lord, as we take this bread, we receive it, God, for our, our sins are forgiven. Your body was broken so that we would have <clears throat> forgiveness of sin and we would have healing for our bodies. Let's take the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just rejoice in you. We thank you for the glory of who you are and this great gift of salvation that you gave us. We remember you today and we love you and we honor you and we worship you and we celebrate you. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and pass your cups to the right and we're gonna continue to worship, amen, and celebrate this beautiful God, amen.
mercy with the lost of love, song of love. Oh, I really love you for all you've done for me. I love you right now. Oh, I really love you. Oh, I love you right now. Sing it out. Sing your song again. This is a very simple but beautiful chorus. I really love you, I love you right now. I have the opportunity to be able to counsel uh, people. And uh, a lot of you don't need personal counsel because you're in the general teaching and you're, you have a lot of uh, strength and stability and you're able to apply the teachings and you're in connect group and just doing well. But a lot of times, I'll, uh, I'll meet with people that along the way they, they've really gotten discouraged. They've really lost self-confidence. And recently I've been telling people, do you know why you're here right now? Do you know why I want to take the time to spend with you? It's the V word. It's value. It's because you're valuable. I've had people say, well, I... I don't know why I, I don't even find myself valuable. I said, tough beans, I do. And God does. The Bible says that the Lord first loved us. I'd like to tell you that I came to the Lord when everything was just smoke and hot and I was just really on the rise. I wasn't a star on the rise, I was a flake on the fritz. Most of us were just ready to hit the side of the mountain when we called out for help. Our first prayer was so selfish, save me. My first prayer wasn't save the kingdom. Oh God, I just want to be nice. And it was like, save me, I'm, I'm a train wreck. And God is so good that that prayer was even something he'd suggested that I pray. Some of the greatest God-inspired prayers go like this, help God. Help me. And that power rushes in, that forgiveness, that life, that energy, that healing. And then all of a sudden you begin to walk with him. And then all hell breaks loose against your mind. Distractions, thorns and thistles to rob the word from growing in your life. And so we come to worship service and we take the table of the Lord 
to say, God, you know how distracted I get, or maybe even you walked in distracted. Heartaches by the numbers, troubles by the score. You know? And we say, you know, as we're worshiping, I, I feel that, that call. He loves me. And in response, I say, I really love you. I love you right now. That doesn't guarantee my performance this afternoon or tomorrow. But right now, with all I have, God, I just want to lift up my heart and say I love you because you are what's right in my life. You're what's right in Medford. You're what's right in Jackson County. You're what's right in Oregon. You're what's right in the United States of America. You're what is right in North America. You're, you are what's right in the continent of Africa. You are what's right down under. You, God, the God of the universe that loves me, you make it right. And I want to touch base with you. I want to let you know I love you right now, God. I remember what you've done for me. That I didn't give you a lot of incentive, but you poured out your love to redeem me from the darkness that I was participating in. I love you. Come on, say it right now. Could we sing that a little bit more, Johnny? Let's just let's just reach out and love the Lord today, could we? worship God more than just a song we sing in church. Let God, the way we live our lives, reflect the love that we have for you, God. I pray for every person here, God, that they would leave this place different than they walked in. God, they would know that they're loved by a Father, but God, they would, they would leave this place to show that love to others, God, and walk in that love and, and show that love to you, God. And lift up your name, Jesus. Bless this time. Bless every person here. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. 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 Well, you may be seated. Welcome, everybody, to Joy Christian Fellowship. We are so glad that you came this morning. Whether you are joining us here in the flesh and in person or you're joining us via live stream, we are excited to have you. Thank you for coming. We're going to have a great service today. Who's excited to be here? Awesome. If this is your first time here to Joy Christian Fellowship and you're here in the building with us, we'd love to get the opportunity to meet you and give you a gift. If you wouldn't mind joining us at the Connections table, right in the foyer, directly following service. Otherwise, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can look at the pew right in front of you. There should be a connections card. If you want to fill that out, that, drop that in the offering. Again, we just want to get to, to meet you and welcome you to the family here at Joy Christian Fellowship. Coming up this Saturday, the 31st, is Circle Youth Ministries' ninth annual golf tournament. Yeah. It is an amazing time. We look forward to it every year, and it's going to rock. 
and it's not too late to get involved. If you want to golf, if you want to volunteer, if you want to give, or you want to come to the amazing dinner that we're going to have, you need to be there. It's going to be awesome. However you want to get involved, it's not too late. You can visit the golf table right in the foyer directly following service and figure out how you can partner with Single Youth Ministries, how you can get involved. And three weeks from now, on June 14th, we are having our Joy Family Fun Day. If you are new here to Joy Christian Fellowship, you should know that we like to have fun. We even name one of our days a fun day. Like, just to be clear, we're going to have fun. And it's for your family. We're going to have a family fun day. Again, that's June 14th. It's going to be at Immigrant Lake at 11 o'clock, and it's $4 per car. Not per person, but per car. And it's going to be a great time. That's all I have for you, except that if you haven't joined a Connect group yet, please make sure to do that. We have a Connect uh, Connect group wall right in the foyer. You can look at all the weird faces and decide which crazy connect group you want to go to. It's a great thing, so make sure to get involved. Now we have Tyler for the offering. All right. How's everyone doing today? Good. It's a good day to be at church, right? Good Sunday, Memorial weekend, but uh, you guys didn't quit, right? We're still here. That's what we want. We're going to be giving the offering message, so if the ushers want to get ready. But before we do, I'm going to read Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19 for anyone that wants to follow. We have it back here for those that didn't bring their Bible to church. All right? Here we go. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, this is an interesting concept. He's saying whoever has money, whoever has something of possession, that's a gift from God. Like, like he didn't say, you know, you've really just, you've earned that, you know, you, you're just that cool. No, he said, that's a gift from God. Wealth can be defined in many different ways. If, if you look in the Bible, uh, in the days of Abraham, we see that wealth was defined by uh, the amount of livestock that someone had. Oh, I have some sheep here, some camels there, some donkeys over here. That doesn't seem that valuable, but whatever it was then, right? Okay, livestock. If you look in the days of Joshua, you see that wealth was defined by the amount of land that someone like dominated and possessed. Like, yeah, I own all of whatever they owned, and that was a lot. That was determined, that, that was wealth for them. Well, then you look at America and, and, and our society, and we determine wealth oftentimes by, well, how big is your house? Well, well, well is, is, that, is, that a, is that a Porsche, you know, or, or maybe a BMW? I, I like Beamers, so I don't have one, though, right? Because I don't have that wealth. No, I'm just kidding. All right? And then, and then maybe your flat-screen TVs or whatever it is, all of these items and possessions. But it's so important that we don't buy into that mentality, but we look to Scripture and say, God, what is wealth? And that is the sum total of all that God has given to us. And it's interesting because God did not put us on this earth to be an owner, believe it or not. He put us on this earth to be a steward, okay? To steward, that means here's God. He's giving to us all that we have, and he says, what are you going to do with it? At the end of the day, it's still mine, but what are you going to do with it? And that's where we today, this Sunday morning, Memorial Day weekend, we get to come before God and say, you know what, God? I'm not going to hold this money that you've blessed me with as if it's mine, it's my precious, right? No, no, no. I am going to give it to God because at the end of the day, it was his anyways, right? So a minimum of 10%. And if you're really thankful and you're like, really, God, this is so yours, you could go above and beyond. Amen? So ushers, go ahead. Get that money.
right. Amen. So we're going to pray for this offering. Sound good? Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come to church on this great weekend. And Lord, give into the house of God. Lord, we recognize that you did not put us on this earth to be an owner, but a steward. And that at the end of the day, all that we have is because of your goodness. So Lord, we ask that you would bless those who gave to this offering today, that you would bless their finances, and that it would be put to your use. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Kids, you are welcome to go to your classes. And Pastor Steve, you're welcome to come up and give the word. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Memorial Day weekend. Woo! Put some newspaper under that man's chair. Uh, you are not at the boat, Nick, this morning. You are not at Rogue Valley Cup. You are not camping, you're not in traction at the hospital, but you're here. And I and the Lord thank you. The Lord, because he doesn't have to zap you, and, uh, and me, because uh, it's nice to talk to somebody. It's really rough when, you know, you look out and it's like <laughs> crickets, and the only remaining person is asleep. Okay. So life is good. Praise God. Three people felt it's good. The rest are just... We're changing our message to God wants you to overcome, not cope. How many of you know the Lord, the Lord wants to make us overcomers and not just people who cope? Now, coping is a good place to start <laughs> as opposed to a complete four-footed, uh, four-legged, uh, you know, crash. Coping is a good place to start, but the goal for the Lord is that we overcome. This is the last session in our Crazy Love series. And uh, as we were worshiping and in, in preparation for this uh, session, which is uh, live love. How can we live the love life that, that Jesus has? And one of the things that our society is really marked by big time is emotion-driven everything. Uh, why did you uh, end up with that interesting tattoo <laughs> uh, all over your back? Well, you know, when I started to drink, I uh, was just having a good time with the boys. Well, something led to something which led to you having a I love mom with all my heart tattoo clear across your back. There are films and, 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 and contemporary movies about, you know, about that kind of thing of people who are just whimsical and they're driven by the whim and the spur of the moment. In fact, there's almost a romantic appeal in our culture which actually deceives people where you can be the slob all your life and then you win the big one just by sheer determination. You know, Rocky being one of the premier. Here's a guy that's just really a slob and he's eating raw... Um, eggs and doing one-arm push-ups and he becomes this major boxer. That could happen, it generally doesn't happen. Just as most things that we do by whim don't remain consistent. The things that we work into our life consistently are the things that we become. I was thinking of Jesus' incentive when the Bible says that and we were just at, you know, at Easter a few weeks ago, that Jesus was marred beyond recognition. Now, um, you know, the, the joke goes that, you know, my wife and I, we had, we had a disagreement. And, uh, and then I didn't see her for two weeks, and then it was just barely through one eye. Uh, <laughs> if you've ever been in a situation where maybe you were in a, a fist fight or you were uh, in a wreck or something and you just get crunched right in the nose and the face and your face swells up, it really impairs your vision. And I'm thinking of Jesus who had really had a time of prayer with extreme crying in Gethsemane before he was crucified. And he was saying, Lord, this whole taking the sin of the world upon me, if it's possible, take this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so when he was arrested, there was peace 
that Jesus manifested when he was led away and we never see him ever waffle about his decision to manifest his love by bearing the sins of the world and being rejected. So he, long before he was nailed to the cross, he probably was a swollen mess as well as lacerated and torn with whips and punches. And, 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 and I'm thinking about those bruised and swollen eyes that through the dim vision that he probably had, one thing he didn't see were his supporters. Because the Bible said that all the disciples, they fled in panic. And, and, and the ones that, and everyone stayed back during his, his trial and a lot of the beatings. Finally at the crucifixion, then the women with, with the Apostle John came right to the foot of the cross when it was really over. But in the emotion of all the hatred and the vehemence, the people that Jesus was going to show love to were happily cheering his beating, his rejection. And through those swollen eyes, the one thing he couldn't see was a friend. If Jesus was really American, trust me, we'd all be going to hell. If he really bought into the American culture, and that is, hey, love when you feel it. Do you know the Bible tells us that we're to walk by faith, not by sight? Did you know that, that we've got five senses, and yet the Bible tells us that we're to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, not lean to our own understanding? And so many times the things that you see aren't quite the reality from God's perspective. The things that you hear aren't going to last. Maybe your opinion of people that you and I have written off in one way or the other, and we're not rooting for them, but God says, that's my servant, they're going to make it. How many of you would like to kind of skip the middleman of, you know, testing, finding yourself mostly wrong all the time? And would like to just start living like Jesus does because Jesus lives by faith. He does what's right to all people all the time. And he harvests the greatest return that anyone ever would. What, what came out of it for Jesus? By faith, he laid down his life in obedience. And he has reaped the greatest harvest that any human ever could. You see, every other leader besides Jesus... There, every person they led was going to go to a grave without the guarantee of resurrection life. That was even Moses and Abraham. They were righteous men. They looked forward to Jesus. But take, for instance, let's say evil leaders and rulers. They might move a lot of people. They might move ar armies. They might adjust things. They might do great architecture. But it's this Jesus that didn't really try to make a whole big thing of, of, of uh, things that he could uh, control who purchased mankind back from, from sin. And the Bible says that every knee is going to bow at the name of Jesus. And that all that put their hope in him will have eternal life, eternal in quality and eternal in uh, duration. All other leaders have led, led their people into uh, nihilism or nihilism to be basically annihilated. <laughs> I'm really glad that, 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 that you and I have chosen to put our trust in Jesus, the one who lives by faith. The one who watches, watch this, who lives the love life by choice, not by emotion. How many of you know, I, I'll get to the, the, I'll get to the punchline and that way you can get back to playing Angry Birds. <laughs> the punchline of this message is, is that we need to live the love life. Not the feeling life. Not I'll love my friends and hate my enemies, which is basically the Gentile way. But if you love everybody, you'll always do what's right. Including even confrontation. 
So, some people don't understand. Pastor Steve, you, you're a confronter. You talk to people all the time and sinner and saint alike. And if they're really thinking something crazy, you correct them. You know why I do it? Because I'm responding to the love life. For me to leave error on the table and walk away just to, just to look nice, to me that's betrayal to that human. So with my kids, when craziness came out, let's sit down, let's talk it through. You know, many parents don't want to have their kids ask them why. I welcomed it. Well, Dad, why don't you like us watching a certain kind of video? Did, did I hear the word why? Let me give you some iced tea. Let's sit down. And we'll take between five minutes to four hours. And we'll go through every possible overturning a stone. So you know, Jake, Johnny, Gino, and Natalie, you know why. Now you're part of my teaching team. Now that you know the philosophy of why we do certain things, you're equipped to go out and help bring others in. Did you know that if every Christian lived the love life, we would, we would seek to build bridges to the, those who don't understand? Just before uh, the meeting, I was chatting with, uh, with Pete and Amy, and we were talking about, about youth culture, that in youth culture... One of the big values in youth culture right now is don't hurt people's feelings. And so, and so it's you are evil if you hurt someone's feelings. Now, there's a, there's a kindness about that. How many of you know that when you love and you live love, you don't seek to hurt people's feelings? <laughs> and so a lot of the young pastors and leaders are reaching into youth culture. And we're talking about guys whose churches are filled with under 30s in big cities like Portland and LA and other places. And they're seeking to build a ramp to say that, that the Bible still teaches against the open practice of lesbianism and homosexuality, but you're not necessarily a sinner because you're tempted in that direction. And we can look at them as, why don't they just get to the truth? Well, if you put a giant speed bump on the freeway, you lose a lot of transaxles and tires. Hello? How many of you wouldn't want someone to put a speed bump on I-5? You're bopping along. Your, your guardian angel is eight miles trying to behind you catching up. And you're doing 75 because you're driving by the Spirit. And you just hit a speed bump and kaboom. You drop your axle. Pop your U joint, uh, joint and your axle falls off. Not your axle, but your uh, drive line. And, and, and you're going, wow. What happened? You, get, you go to ODOT. What are you people doing? Well, out of love, we wanted to give you a speed bump so you guys would slow down. Could we have had some warning? <laughs> I think we older Christians... We have got to understand that, that younger pastors and younger leaders are trying to engage their generation in such a way they can get them to the same destination without kind of the abruptness that we could afford because we didn't live in a different world. In a, in a world where many young people are wondering if there's any truth, those of us who grew up with empirical truth and geometry and physics and science now Science is just used by political parties to manipulate their, their cause. And so young people are untrustworthy of things and they haven't seen marriage work. And so we come along and go blah, 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 blah. We declare our high and holy and lofty and real goals. But if we don't put the cookies on the, on the bottom shelf out of love, we can't stair step them up. How many of you know that our, our challenge being the church is to train people on simple things like how to brush your teeth, how to get a job, not how to be a CEO necessarily up front, but how to get a job, the value of work, the value of longevity in relationships, the value of purity, love. Love, love will affirm, love will build a bridge, and love will also... Pick a fight from time to time. Jesus was great for getting up into people's grill and saying, you, you've read, heard, heard it said of old, you shall not do this, but I say unto you, and he, and he upped the standard. 
He did, he did things to just irritate people. Like, you're with people who are, are eating a kosher diet in John chapter 6, and he's saying, oh, by the way, if, if you follow me, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Wow, I haven't even gone to twilight yet. And now I'm asked to be a vampire to follow this guy. Jesus shook things up. But he shook things up to get people to come back and do a second take where he could... He could bring them into the loving change that he had for them. Last week we were looking at John chapter 15. This is a long intro. And many times the sermon ends on the intro. Many people have told me, preach freely till noon. Keep going till one, we'll leave at noon. And, uh, but... uh, John 15, 9 through 17, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Wow. Wow. In the very same manner that Father loves Jesus, Jesus loved us. Abide, dig in, hang out, camp here, live here, change your email address to this, make this your homepage for your Facebook, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Wow, we're thinking, whoa, this ought to be really heavy. He's probably going to list the Ten Commandments. He's not going to list the Ten Commandments, though Jesus did keep them. And I believe that through the Spirit of God, we're going to find out we're keeping the Ten Commandments anyway. We're not going to have other gods before the Lord. We're not going to commit adultery. We're not going to covet people's donkeys and their their yard, their car, their wife. How many of you know if you're in the Spirit, you're, you're keeping the old Ten Commandments pretty much? Not because you feel like you have to, just because you feel like it's the, uh, the privilege. And so we're not discounting the Old Testament at all. But Jesus is basically wrapping up the Old Testament into certain veins of, 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 of uh, obedience. If you're in the vein of obedience in, in, in one area as opposed to another which is the hate life or the love life, when you walk in the love as Father loved Jesus and Jesus has loved you, trust me, every commandment becomes real easy, no-brainers. Sexual purity becomes no-brainer, especially if you could use other people and escape seemingly intact. Hello? And then you begin to realize love does no evil to to its neighbor. So maybe I'm lonely and I want to use someone sexually and say goodbye and keep it light, but they really need someone to be in their life a long time. And so you imply you might be, and then you roll on. That's not love. Do we need to to have it printed out, thou shalt not fornicate, thou shalt not commit adultery, or how about sum it up? You won't burn anybody in any area and defraud them when you walk the love life. So it makes morality real easy to me. (laughs) Ripping somebody off in business. Well, we know there's commandments against extortion and against uh, usury and and, and taking advantage of people and holding someone's pledge through the night when they're shivering in the cold. Yep, we might have needed the commandment at one time, but I think if you live the love life, it's a no-brainer. That it's better for the sake of peace to get defrauded and to lose some money sometimes. It's better that we, we have a food pantry where there are some folks that come in and they, they're just using the system and they might think they're sly and they're burning the church because they're getting free food. God bless them. We love them and their children. I'd rather get burned by some users so I can reach the people who really are in need. I'm going to insulate my life. No one's going to ever hurt me. Then you're going to cut off the innocent too. You're going to insulate yourself so well that even your husband won't feel your love. Even your children won't feel your love. And eventually even God doesn't feel your love. Because you turn from the kingdom of love to the kingdom of hate. He said here, you'll abide in my love just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Well, you talked about commandments. Now you're down to commandment. 
Because all the other commandments are summed up in loving one another. You know, when people try to find from me, unsaved people, well, what's the complexity of Christianity? I, I don't know what it is. It's not complex to me. Man's a wreck. <laughs> How many of you have ever read the Bible? And if you do read one, read the Holy One, the Holy Bible. That's a good one. But by Genesis chapter 3, man's in a train wreck, and it takes all the rest of the Bible to get him out of it. Hello? From, from Genesis 3 to what, Revelation 22? The new heavens and the new earth. All the other time, it's all help, God helping us get over ourselves. And so when people are in denial, I think we're basically getting better. Really? What neighborhood do you live in? Do real people live there? Are you sedated? <laughs> How many of you know that man, man's heart is dark? And we need a savior. And he says, I will freely give you my love, my forgiveness. I'll give you the credit for following every commandment, every jot, every tittle, dotted every I, crossed every T. I did it for you, and I'll impart my righteousness to you. But what I ask is that you receive it and acknowledge my right to tell you, please don't do weird, trippy things. Please don't date an animal. Please don't shack up with your mother-in-law. Please don't have sex outside of marriage. It only hurts others, including yourself. Don't just step on everybody because you can. I want you to love like I've loved you. And I loved you when you were a really rotten mess hating me. I laid my life down for you. And that's how I want you to love each other. People, I, I love you and you bother me. How many of you know, like one guy said, I love the ministry, it's people I hate. Do you ever even get tired of yourself? I often do. There's sometimes I'm sitting and I'm thinking, I go, I'm tired of hearing you say that. There's no one in the room but me. I'm schizophrenic and so are we. Um, <laughs> Do you ever get tired of your own thoughts? Do you ever get tired of your own human weakness? That's why praise and worship is such an awesome outlet. Get your mind on somebody that did it right. Not even, how am I doing, how am I doing, mirror, mirror? No, I don't want to hear the mirror. I want to look into the perfect law of liberty in Jesus Christ. And as I see him and I see the new creation reality of who I am made to be and given to me in title deed, I'm able to change into that. But see, if I take that from me, I've got to hand it to everyone else too, don't I? Understand that every one of you that call the name of Jesus have been made perfect by forgiveness. And he's changing you and training you. And he's patient with you and I'm called to be patient with you. Yeah, but I'm not you, Jesus. You're supposed to be. Hello? How many of you know we are called to be the body of Christ? Well, we need someone to, to show the love of God. Yeah, committee of me, committee of you, committee of one. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. I was telling someone at dinner yesterday that I want to be like Jesus, and I quoted the scripture to them. You're my friends if you do whatever I command you. <laughs> How many of you know you've got to put it in context? There's more to it than that. Just take that out of context. What's your theme for Bible college? You're my friends if you do what I command you. That's kind of what infancy is. You know, little Kai, you know, he sits in his high chair and he wants to rule mom and dad and everyone else, right? King baby. How many of you know we're still fighting king baby, aren't we? I call you friends if you do the things I command you. Uh, many people will tell you, I've just isolated my life because I don't want to have anyone bother me and I want to just do what I want to do. Well, that's not the love life. That's the self life. 
Jesus was able to say it. He said, you're my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. What fruit? The fruit of what's been given to you, you give away. Someone spoke to you, someone prayed for you to come to Jesus Christ. My family has a a long-term family friend, a Native American guy by the name of Joe Bates. Joe fasted working at a mill for three weeks that my mom and dad would come to Christ. And they came to Christ. They become very, very fast friends. I can't think of fasting for any reason for three weeks. It's like someone says, okay, you're going to have to fast for three weeks or else I go, man, count, you know, take the body count right now. I don't know. <laughs> what did Joe do? Joe laid down his life that a family would come to Christ. So every person that walks the aisle at Joy, Joe Bates is getting a share of that harvest because he set off a chain in a family where we're all Christian and we're trying to spread Christianity. That's what it means to lay down your life. That's what it means to go and bear fruit, not to bogart the goodness. Hey, I'm glad for forgiveness. I'm glad God wants to prosper me. I'm glad that God gave me a beautiful wife and some good kids. That's all I need. The Lord never called you to only get what you need. The Lord called you that you would get a lot more than you need so you can give to those who can't gather so that the the abundant can distribute to those who lack. holiday message. I mean, I might as well be up here saying, and ringy dingy ding, let's go home. Just getting by is not enough. That's not what God's called. Just enough love that I feel pretty good about my life. Well, then, then stress it a little bit. Go out with people that are deeply depressed. Oh, dude, I don't want to do that. That'll bring me down. That's the point. The point is, 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 is put a load on your circuitry to see if you got some real power flowing through it. Jesus could have a whole crowd, a whole field of people with leprosy, you know, blindness, demons, and he's just going boom, 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 you're healed, 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 you know, and then he says, hey, freely you receive, freely give. When you put a load on Jesus' circuitry, it didn't flip the breakers. If one depressed person pops your breaker and you need to go on vacation for two weeks, you need to dig in a little bit more. You need to get some of the love life working for you. We need to be interfacing and the change elements. I'm so full of the love of God. I'm so full of the life of God. You get around me, there's going to be an overflow from the abundance. I'm going to be so full of joy and rejoicing that you may not even be thinking about your coming to Jesus. You're just sucked in by the enthusiasm. Like a salmon, you know, gets hooked. I didn't want to go in that boat, but I'm here. Is this okay, y'all? I chose you and appointed you. You've been commissioned. You and I have been commissioned. To get, get a hold of that crazy love, understand, you were crazily pursued. When you were dead in your sins, Jesus said, I want you. You know what moves me probably more than, than almost anything? Is that the longer that I've walked with him, the more I understand what a sinner I am. That king baby is always there to rise up and demand, serve self. I want to just tell you something, and it's bad news, but it ends with good news. Did you know that salvation doesn't kill your old nature? What it does, it gives you power to overlive it. The only way to kill your old nature is have Jesus return or you die. Until then, we wake up every day and we reckon our flesh dead. And we take up our cross daily. 
I'd like to be at that point where I get so mature that sin, temptation, nothing bothers me, getting bugged by people, having to live love, having to uh, go outside of my comfort zone. I'd like to get it to where I just become possessed by God. I'm a ch Christian chatty Kathy doll. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Just love you, brother. Hallelujah. Power up. Keep your chin up. Maybe a, dress, a Weight Watchers clinic and just tell them, hey, don't be discouraged. Keep your chins up, guys, girls, you know. <laughs> This thing of having to daily take up my cross and choose. What, what spirit am I going to wear today? When I know I have a counselee coming into my office, I, I, I sometimes my mind is going, man, I, I don't want to talk to anybody. And the Holy Spirit says, put on, put on the spirit. Get ready. Someone's going to walk in these doors. They need some hope today. They need to know that God is for them. They need to know that you're pulling for them. Sure, you might have to jostle them a little bit. Sure, you might have to confront some stinking thinking. But at the end of the day, you should be hugging and rejoicing because it's game time now. They're going out of this office with some new hope and a future. Oh dear, he shouted. Kim stole my thunder. She read Romans 5. <laughs> Romans 5, verse 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for sinners. Now, this is NLT. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. We need to love the sinners in our culture. People in our culture are rejoicing because Christian morals are being toppled. Well, let's all pull in and let's hate them. Really? Really? They're just returning to the world that Jesus and the apostles said, wow, this is our peach. Let's, let's, let, let, let's eat it. We're just returning to paganism like in the Greek and Roman Empire when one less than 100% were Christians. How many of you know when it was Jesus and 11 survivors? That's a thin percentage of Christians in the world then. There's still 80 million believers in America. And we're getting stepped on, and a lot of people are saying, whoa, we're getting our rights now. And we're going, man, biblically we know it's the right to kill yourself. It's the right to go to hell. I'm going to cop an attitude. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to love you. And just what the devil wants. Carterize their hope. What we have to do is to say, you know what? Love means when you're blind, I'll describe mauve. When you're blind, I'll, 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 I'll describe blue. <laughs> My wife, she was a rich girl. She had like 256 colors in her color thing. That's how rich kids, their folks, when they go, got supplies, mine, it was eight. So I know red, green, mauve, I think, and burgundy are the only colors that are not in the packet of eight that I even know. You know, blue, turquoise blue. When you're blind, and we, all, we walk by the unsaved many times, and we go, they, they're, they're stupid, they don't see. They're not stupid. They are logically believing the lie they've been instructed. Now, we can curse the darkness, and we can, we can hold up, and we can have more, more, and more, and more, and more, you know, separationist things or we can say hey boys and girls when we leave here we enter the mission field and we build bridges of hope when 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 a, a lesbian gal leans across your your fence and she's sobbing because her lesbian partner left her can i tell you what i'd do i'd cry with her because she lost someone that she felt she loved. 
And what she needs is she needs a broken heart with her. And then later, when there's a bridge there, you can, you can begin to address. But if your response is, hey, you should have never been, you know, playing, playing that game. It's not the time yet. When someone's leaning across your fence and they're broken hearted because they found out their kid's been hooked on meth, been stealing from them and their and grandma, it's easy to just jump up and, yeah, well, if you were a good parent, maybe or maybe not. How about a bridge? That's what Jesus does. You must feel extreme pain. Can I pray with you? Can I be honest with you? I've, I've, I've come on to a lot of crises. Even the time I came second to last in the pear blossom. <laughs> and Dola Johnson is, after my wife, she's the woman I love the most in the world. Because she's the one that finished after me. <laughs> Out of 1,700 people, Steve Schmelzer and Dola. Dola was a double amputee on, on, on sticks, I think. <laughs> While I was on that run, walk, I mean, for me, a dude starts having heart trouble. And I asked him and his family that were right there, do you mind if I pray? No problem. I prayed. One time, Kim and I, it was about 7 o'clock in an evening, and it was dark in the winter, and a guy got hit crossing Table Rock. His shoes were about 30 feet in front of where his body landed. He laid there like dead. He, I didn't ask him if I could pray. I went over, and people were gathered around in the name of Jesus, and people were bowing their, 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 their heads. One, guy play, one time I was playing softball, and a guy was sliding into third, and I put the tag on him right on his head. Ka-funk! It was like getting hit with a blackjack by a bouncer. And he goes into convulsions. This is in the Ashland City League. I thought, dude, I just did this. i got to undo it. Right in front of his team and my team, which were the Ashland Four Square guys, so they were cool with it, but the others maybe not. I go... Be healed in the name of Jesus. He was back in in two innings and we lost. I've, I've refined, Lord, heal him after the game is over. <laughs> While we were sinners, God sent Christ to die for us. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. We're not under condemnation. Every time you come in prayer, Father comes out like I'm going to tomorrow night when Natalie gets home from Eugene bringing Evie. You think I'm going to run out there to see my Ev angry? Grandpa's eyes are going to be so soft. Well, Ev, let's start the games. Every time you and I come to prayer with God, it's you that tells God we don't have time. He comes out with those soft eyes and he said, Well, Denny, well, Susie, well, Kim, it's so good to see you. And yet I find out that I have got to choose to stay in the love of God. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Well, how do you really get it together? What do I need to tell my kids to do to have a good family? That's the wrong thing to start with. Don't tell. Get on some be attitudes. Yeah. Be sweet, Mom. Be sweet, Dad. Seek to say yes as often per day as you can. 
Daddy, I'd like, to, I'd like to go buy this book on devotions. I'd like to pray more. Yes. Dad, I'd like to study this instrument. Yes. Dad, I'd like to go to a stripper bar. No. Heck no. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. How many of you know that sometimes Christian parents look like the no people and they're wondering why the kids want to leave concentration camp? Make it heaven on earth. Make it pleasant. Mom, would you show me how to make a puddle cake? Yep. No, I don't have time. Hey, Daddy, would you come and would you watch me play? Hey, you know, I'm busy. When you lay your life down for people, it's amazing how your schedule opens up. When Jesus wants you to pray, it's amazing when you're in love with him how your schedule opens up. You sacrifice Jude 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Wow. Well, how do we really live the love life? I'm going to give you a few points and we're going to end this. First principle is always stay aware of how much God's love is aimed at you. <laughs> Do you know what blows everybody away that, 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 that don't know Jesus? It blows them away that there's like one planet has got all the groovy stuff going on it. And the rest of them look like, wow, they were just hangers. I mean, come on now. I think, I think Venus is cool, you know, with the, the, the bright, shiny star looking thing and Mars that's red. That's kind of cool. After that, there's not a whole lot of coolness. You know, hey, tell me about the, the, about the five, your five favorite birds from off the planet Mars. Eh, no sign of life. The moon, wow, great for your aquariums, lots of dust. Earth. Earth is so cool because God said, I need a blackboard to write history on. And I want that blackboard to reflect my diversity, my beauty. And so the earth, wherever I've gone, and memories of riding across the flat plain of Central Europe in Hungary or in Germany from Frankfurt down towards Munich and seeing the, the, the German and Austrian Alps and seeing the Andes in South America and seeing the beauty of the rice fields in Cambodia and the beauty of the diversity flying over Greenland and Iceland on the way into Europe. And you look and you go, wow, this amazing huge planet. And the only real explanation from a biblical perspective is, is that God really wanted this to be a neat apartment for the fam. If he wanted to do that ubiquitously, he'd have decorated every other planet groovily like this. But this is the one that, that isn't just a big rock with some properties. This is the one that he, he put other aspects, living grasses, trees, birds, animals, and humans. And so I know that, 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 that God said, let us make man in our image and so we can have fellowship. And, so, and then from Genesis 3, we muff it and he comes after us through Jesus, through the prophets, through the word, saying, come home, you guys, come. Come be family. Let's do family together. Barney preaches the gospel better than some people I know. I love you, you love me. We're a happy family with a great big hug and a kiss from me and you. Won't you be my family too? Won't you love me too? Say you love me too. We're a great big family. Our culture, I don't want anybody to touch me. I don't want to be family. God's saying, I, I want you in my family. Stay, as Jude says in Jude 21, verse 21. Keep yourselves in the spigot of God's love. The commandments funnel down to loving like I've been loved. When I find my love for you thinning out, I go, God, forgive me. I gotta hide away before I 
belch out frogs and toads out of my mouth. I've got to get under the spout of God's love. You love me with crazy love. You love me. You're crazy. You came to me. You visited me in that March afternoon on Scenic Drive in Ashland in 1971. You called me onto a great adventure. You have been with me. You have been my shield. You have been my favor. You have been the fear of my life. You are for me. What can man do against me? If God is for us, who can be against us? We are in the love of God. Stand up and we'll finish this sermon together. I think we need to get a little excited about being the target of God's affection. Act like it makes you happy. Pastor, I'm going to a weenie roast after this. Could we just kind of wrap this up? I want to get in your heart. I want you to wake up sometimes at night not crying from sorrow, but where you're so overjoyed that you're crying from relief. I'm loved. I'm loved. He came after me. Come on. This is why we love altar calls. This is why we love people coming to Jesus because the Bible said the angels and heaven rejoices when somebody comes home. And it's fun watching you guys in your life when I see the stalker creeping up on you. Oh, the enemy? No, not the enemy. I'm so tired of the enemy. The enemy can stick it as far as I'm concerned. I'm talking about the one that said, surely in goodness shall follow me. David said this, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. You're being stalked. Yeah, the devil's out to try to trip you up, but I'll tell you something. The winner is stalking you. You may have one-third of the angels against you and one archangel, but you've got two archangels for you. You've got two-thirds of the angels. You've got the Trinity working for you. You've got the Word of God. You've got the family of God. You've got Jesus ever living to make intercession for you. If we can't do this thing successfully, there was no hope. God loves you. You stay in the love of God. Then number two, you aim God's love at others. Don't check your emotions on whether or not you should love. Well, let's see, this, this person really bugs me. I don't think I'm going to love them. Really? Do you have a choice? Do you really have a choice? Answer is, yes, we make a choice, but B, we weren't given a choice by God. Or secondly, God says love is your loved. He loved you when you were a sinner. When people are being nasty and vile to you, you still have to turn back and say, Lord, I've got to be loving. You might bless them, like the prayer for the czar in Fitter on the Roof. They asked the rabbi in the Fitter on the Roof, what's your prayer for the czar of Russia? He said, Lord, bless and keep the czar far, far from here. <laughs> Sometimes you have to separate from people who are practicing evil. But the minute that you say they're not worthy of love, you've now become a judge. And you're not a servant of God. You're now a judge. Because none of us deserve the love. Number three, love is an action and it's a choice. Number four, the more you practice it, the more it becomes natural. Number five, what you sow, you'll reap. Jesus looked there as his Pound, pounded eyes. They pounded him in the face and they ripped his beard and they put a crown of thorns and on the cross he said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. Sure looked like it sucked to be Jesus. He didn't get paid back for what he gave. Eh. Yeah, he did. There will literally be hundreds of millions or more believers in heaven. Though those eyes were so swollen they couldn't see one friend. His eyes will see fields full of worshipers. 
I've been in a field with 80,000 people worshiping Jesus. It's pretty awesome. When you look back and you see the multitude, it looks like moving grass. What's heaven going to be like? Though those eyes were beaten shut, those eyes get to see the fruit. You and I, when we love, instead of following what's natural, we'll, we'll see it. Maybe, maybe you love someone, they betrayed you, they left you, they tore your heart and stomped on it. That love will come. That individual may never, ever be the source. God says what you sow, you're going to reap. How many of you say, I'm going I'm to sow love? First John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. You want to know how you can live the, the, the living love life? Love the brethren. Love us with our flaws. Don't give up on us. You might have to say, I don't know. Pastor Dick used to get bad reports on some of us pastors. And he had the same report for all of us. They'd say, Schmelzer's doing great in Medford. And he'd go, that's my boy. Then a bad report one time. Schmelzer's doing terrible. The guy's rotten. And that's my boy. How many of you know that we don't lose identification with each other? If someone's doing poorly in the house of the Lord, that's my boy. That's, I, won't, I won't deny him. How many of you want to pass from death to life? First Peter 1 Peter 1.8, last verse. You're helping me preach. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The lovers who live the love life, you can't repress their joy. They have a sparkle in their eye. I want to be that. How about you? Say, crazy love. love. I I want it. I've received it. I want to give it. Right now, as we're finishing up this series and this message, I want to give an opportunity for people, not only here in the house, but people that watch our live stream and those that will watch the archive. We we took the title for this series, Crazy Love, because so many of us in this house have no clue what God ever saw in us. It's beautiful to be loved in another's eyes. The most wise and understanding eyes in the universe are God's. And he called people to be in his family. And he sees what he sees. So much that out of value, he spent Jesus to buy us from sin. You may not understand this, but week after week, people come in here and they feel something different. I feel love here in this place. I feel God. I feel an alien. That's okay. God is an alien. He lives out in outer space in heaven. And when you feel his presence, it's like an alien in a room because one is. The Bible said that whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. In fact, it says they will be saved. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord, the Lord will take away their shame. The gospel is simply this, that all of us humans, whether straight or not, whether honest or not, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's expectation. From the first sin on, we needed the blood of Jesus to take away our sins. Calling on the name of the Lord is not a promise that you will change your life. It's a promise that you are permitting God to change your life. It's you are saying, God, you need to save me. I've tried to change my life so many times. I need you to save me, God. And what happens is the Bible said that when you call on his name, that you in a moment are changed. All your sin is completely paid for 
by the blood of Jesus. That's past, current, anything you'll do. By faith, your sin is under the blood of Jesus. He comes in. He inhabits you. The Spirit of God enters your life. He begins to train you on how to bring agreement with your action to what, who He is. You're brought into His family. You're given the power to pray. That every time that you take that time to pray, you've got Father God coming in. And He's seated with you. And He's saying, hey, I love you. I want you. I want to hear your voice. Hallelujah. If you're here today or you're watching on the live stream, we're going we're gonna to pray with you. Come on down. If you're here and you've not asked Christ into your life, we want to welcome you into the kingdom of God. So come on, come on. I believe there are more folks here. We want to pray with you that you would receive the crazy love of God. God's love for you is crazy. It's awesome. He wants to save you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last call. Come on down. We want to agree with you. We want to pray with you. And wherever you may be, just pray this prayer with us. And, and as you put your faith and trust, watch the magic that happens in your life. Watch the fact that your life goes from death to life as you call on the name of the Lord. Let's, let's all pray this prayer. Father, I thank you that you love me. You've been pursuing me that I might know you and be your child. I thank you for the crazy love that you showed through Jesus Christ. You gave Jesus to pay for my sins when I was still a sinner, still alienated from you at opposition to your ways and to your holiness. But you said that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall not be ashamed. Take away my shame. Hear my call. Save me, God. If you'll be my God, I'll be your servant. If you'll be my father, I'll be your child. I receive you this day, dear Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I'd like to pray one last prayer. How many of you guys say, you know, Pastor, as you're talking, I realize I need to stay under the love spout. I get condemned. Even trying to read the Bible and seeing God's holy law, at times I just beat myself up and I need to know how pursued I am, how loved I am. Anybody? Get the hands up, man. Now put your hands down. Many of us will be double flyers here. How many of you say, and I have got to love that way to others? Let's put both hands up then. Did you know the Lord is already pouring out that love on you? He wouldn't have had this series being preached if he didn't intend on meeting you. Do you know what it takes to get the order sent? Just say, God, I need it. Say it with me. God, I need your love. I need to stay in the zone of your love. Lord, I need to be reminded that you pursue me. Not just pursued, but you pursue your love never gives up. You're patient. You keep working in my account. You haven't thrown me away. And Lord, I receive that love. Help me, Lord, to give it out. To be patient, sacrificial, like you are. Thank you for the love of God. I thank you that I'm a recipient and a giver of crazy love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.